How's everybody doing? Good. Can you hear me? Or do I need the PA? Okay, good. How's this? Is this better? Or is it too much? Anyways. So, uh, good evening. My name is Anthony Brett. I'm the president of the uh, Neighbors of the Mayo Peninsula. And tonight we're uh, hosting another delegate forum, delegate uh, for District 7. Uh, Ms. Hare and Mr. Kitchen, they're going to be buying it out here in a few weeks. So, we thought we would give you another opportunity to ask them questions. Uh, as you see, some of our people in the blue shirts, they will be walking around giving you 3 by 5 cards. If you have a question, put it on there, and then hand it to one of us, and we'll get it up to the moderator. Mr. Bill is going to be moderating this evening. He'll be asking questions. We'll have a timekeeper. And uh, unless anybody has any further questions, uh, I think I saw this mic here. Yeah. You want to stand up and introduce yourself real fast? I'm Mike Shea. I hope to be the <coughs> next delegate. And if so, if you vote for me, I promise to give you reasonable and responsible representation. Okay. On that note, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Bill, who's going to moderate for the, for the evening, and we will go from there. Good evening. We are going to be uh, starting by giving each of the candidates two minutes to do a brief introduction for themselves. They had a longer period in the primary, so we were just getting to know them. Hopefully you have seen the website, you've seen the articles and the letters that have been written about them and by them. So we're going to start by giving uh, Mr. Kitchen two minutes to introduce himself and then Ms. Hare. At the end of the presentation, when we're finished with the last question, the candidates will have an opportunity for closing comments. Ms. Hare will go first. Mr. Kitchen will be the final speaker. So at this time, Mr. Kitchen, the floor is yours. Well, first, I just want to start by thanking all of you for being here, for the neighbors of the Mayo Peninsula for, for hosting this. This is democracy in action. And I, it just means so much to be here with you and to have all of you come out to participate in this. So my name is James Kitchen, and I'm running for county council here in District 7. So I grew up in this district, grew up playing community sports, you know, swimming, fishing, crabbing in the South River. And I graduated from Arundel High School. Lauren and I are raising our kids here. We live in Crofton. My kids are eight and six. So that's third grade and kindergarten. They both go to Crofton Woods Elementary, which is at 118% capacity right now. It is the most overcapacity elementary school in the county, and they keep building in our neighborhood. Um, and that's one of, the reasons, one of the reasons we jumped into this race. So uh, my background is really that of an educator. So I was a high school teacher. I taught government. U.S. history and world history to high schoolers, and then a few years ago I switched, and I now work at UMBC, where I do public policy research, and I study local governments. I study city and county governments in large metropolitan areas, and there are a couple of things that I think my background brings to the table that are pretty unique. So first, as a former teacher, I'm going to be a very bold advocate for our teachers, for our students, for our public schools. Second, as someone who studied public policy, I think I can really help professionalize the decision-making process on the county council. I have been to council meetings where they have made $30 million, 20-year decisions, and they don't have the information that they need in order to, to make wise choices. I have been trained in policy analysis. I know what questions to ask. I know what data to look at. You can be guaranteed that if I'm on the council, every vote I cast will be based on ample public input, the most recent scientific evidence, the best data we can get our hands on, and will always be cast in the best interest of the general public and not in the best interest of a small group of campaign donors. I started this race you know, just as an educator, as a researcher. I was not tied into any political structure. I was not part of the political machine of either party. And I'm really proud of, of the reception that we've got as we've gone around and campaigned. If we've knocked on doors, gone to community meetings, and sat down for endorsement interviews and tried to get support, my campaign, we have been endorsed by the teachers, by the police, by the firefighters, by the League of Conservation Voters, by the Sierra Club, by the AFL-CIO. I'm small money certified. They did not know me before. I took my message of smart growth, of education, and of the environment, the three things we're focusing on, took them to those groups with my background, and I've gotten all their support. So I ask you to stand with them. If education is a topic you care about, 
Vote for the guy who spent his career on the inside of the classroom. Vote for the guy the teachers are recommending to you. If public safety is an issue, stand with the police and the firefighters and vote to put me in office. If you care about the environment, vote with the people that work on the ground on those issues and vote to put me in office. If you are on Maine and you care about these issues, I have been to lots of community meetings on the peninsula over the past year. Vote for the person who showed up. The, my time is up. But <laughs> that, 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 that threw me, but I am very, very glad to be here with you tonight. <laughs> Good evening, my name is Jessica Hare. I am a candidate for county council in this district. I'm going to give a quick shout out, especially to this gentleman in the Red Sox hat over here. Let's hear it for the Red Sox. I spent my early years in Boston, so that's exciting to watch them go. Uh, uh, thank you all for having me here tonight. I now live in Edgewater with my husband. We are raising four children together. I uh, just literally just a hop, skip, and a jump down the road. Uh, so I am a mom, I'm a wife, I'm also a volunteer, a civil engineer, and an attorney. Um, so I have a lot of varied experiences that I bring to the table for the next county council. On the volunteer side, I'm a court-appointed special advocate for children in foster care. I do have an active case. I work with uh, this young girl. I actually have court for her next week um, in sort of what's in the best interest of the child. Our, our mission is to find a safe, permanent place for all children um, to live and to thrive. Uh, I've also been a volunteer on the Anne Arundel Women's Commission, where uh, the mission is to improve the quality of lives for women and families in the county, so that could be anything from Narcan trainings to human trafficking uh, panels and, and the like. Um, I've had an opportunity to volunteer for Governor Hogan on numerous occasions um, in court, defending his right of delegate appointment um, during vacancies uh, in his campaign war room. I'm now on Team Hogan as a candidate. I'm very proud of that. It's been an exciting time. I think he's doing some really good things for our state. Uh, I am a civil engineer. I got a Bachelor of Science from George Washington University. I spent three years designing erosion and sediment control, stormwater, uh, sanitary sewer, all of those uh, critical infrastructure things, and then I put myself through law school. And I say all this to say that I bring a lot to the table, particularly when it comes to the general development plan. I can understand the real world impact of what it means when you put a development over here for the people who live across the street and what infrastructure we need. So if you're interested in that and you have concerns about that, I have a strong voice and a strong uh, ability to advocate for really what's in the community's best interest and what the community wants from a practical real world background. Uh, I ask for your vote on November 6th. Thanks so much. Question this evening, Ms. Hare will start. All right, I'll and keep it. The question is both of you have supported keeping South County rural and controlling overdevelopment. If you are elected, what specific legislation will you present to the council to advance that effort? So I think there's a couple of things here actually, and this gets to the Enclave project in uh, Crofton. There are a few loopholes in the. Oh, sorry, sorry, how much time do I have for this? Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a few loopholes that are currently in the code right now that I think are problematic. Um, one of them has to do with how we account for space in the schools and whether they are open or closed. And it seems to me that when a school is open, it's open for everybody and it doesn't matter if it's got 30 seats available or 100 seats available. I think we need to make sure that we have a corresponding um, limit on the amount of development that can go in based on the actual number of seats that are available. And I think if we make that link, that will help prevent some of the circumstances we're seeing now. We've also seen some issues where um, what has originally been age-restricted housing, after it's uh, already been permitted, has been converted to non-age-restricted housing once the school has been open. I think that if we need to close the loophole that allows that without public hearing and comment. Um, so those are two pieces that I think would be critical in, in helping some of that. Thank you. Mr. Kitchen. Thank you. So keeping South County rural is one of the first political memories that I have. Growing up in Crofton, I remember John Clocko running for county council when I was probably in middle school. And you know, I heard the phrase, keep South County rural. And it's still a refrain for a couple reasons. One, South County has been able to push back and protect a lot of its rural heritage, which is good. But two, it's still a political rallying call because there is still the threat of overdevelopment encroaching down into South County. 
And so we've got to deal with that. The most important piece of legislation I'd put in on, on that issue specifically would be campaign finance reform. So there is talk on the county level, and I think this is a minimum, of banning developer contributions when a developer has pending legislation before the county. And so that needs to happen. And I think the gold standard is really creating a system of publicly financed campaigns where people can run on a campaign fueled solely on small contributions from the communities, from the people that actually live here. And that's when you know that the loyalties of your lawmakers are going to be on the side of the communities and not the side of the big developers. Why do the developers keep developing and keep developing? Because they have so much power in the political process. If we're not willing to talk about the power that their money buys them, then we're not going to get a long-term solution to that problem. We're just not. We're going to push back sometimes. I sometimes use a casino analogy when I talk about this. We will push back on some developments and, and we'll win, but over the long run, the house always wins. And right now, the developers control the house. We have to take that back for them, and we do that by going after their money. There are also lots of loopholes that, that do need to be closed. What's funny about that, the school capacity, what Ms. Harris just explained, actually is currently the law. They changed it. Team Shu changed it to where they do actually count the seats now. The problem is they, they wrote a lot of sunset after the election. And, and so we know what the solutions are. We just don't have the politically will to, to make them last because of the, the power that their money has bought them. Thank you, Mr. Kittens. Now, you're going to have the first answer on the next question. What do you see as the most pressing need for infrastructure in the county? The most pressing need for infrastructure in the county. <laughs> there are a lot of infrastructure needs that we have in the county. Um, I would say schools, roads, and, and public safety infrastructure would, would be the, the three biggest needs, um, which really gets to the core of why I did jump into this race in the first place. But traffic has been getting absolutely out of control. It is out of control. I, I've learned how to drive here, and I am not sure in eight years when my daughter is going to be learning how to drive that I'm going to be willing to teach her how to drive in my own community. Like, I might have to take her on a weekend trip just to teach her how to drive in a car in a place where it's safe to do so. So I think we need to invest in traffic infrastructure upgrades for sure, especially on a peninsula where there's one road in and one road out. It is absolutely ridiculous to keep building in places where that happens. Um, so I'd be very interested in that. Public safety infrastructure, our response times are low, especially out here on the Mayo Peninsula. We do have a substation um, with a BLS, a, a basic life support service ambulance um, that is temporary right now. We need to make that permanent and we need to have a paramedic on it and have it be an advanced life support. I did a ride along with the station and I went out in a BLS ambulance where there's no paramedic and we picked up this guy that had a head injury and we needed to be able to like stabilize him and we literally had to stop and transfer him to a different ambulance that had the, the technology to do that um, and then get him to the hospital. And that's crazy, like you need a permanent substation on the peninsula and you need to have ALS services so if anyone has a heart attack, that they can be taken care of. And then schools, our, our kids are overcrowded. My daughter had 30 kids in her first grade class. That is way too much. And again, my kids go to Crofton Woods, which is at 118% capacity, the most overcapacity school in the entire county. That is just not what our kids deserve. Our kids deserve to have small class sizes. They deserve to go into schools that are not getting overcrowded because of the way development is happening. And so those are the three things, and, and I would link all of those back to development. Um, if we can't control development, we're not going to fix those infrastructure issues. Ms. Harris. So we agree on some of this. I do think uh, schools are a major infrastructure need that this county faces. Um, I also think uh, roads are a major infrastructure issue that we face. Um, the third one that I would actually look at would be stormwater and sort of flooding issues, erosion and sediment control that all goes in with that, particularly on the Mayo Peninsula, also in Edgewater Beach, there's a lot of these issues. Um, down in South County in Rosehaven, they've got a road as well that floods every year. They're trying to literally raise the elevation of the road, the entire road, because they've got these flooding issues. And I think we need to take a really good hard look overall, particularly in District 7, but in the county as a whole, at some of these flooding problems and the erosion and sediment control. Um, it, it may also be linked to some overdevelopment in places, but we need to actually take a look whether we need additional uh, drainage ditches, whether we need more reforestation 
foundation to help um, you know filter some of that water out, et cetera, and prevent some of this additional erosion. I think that's something that the county needs to take a really hard look at. Um, on the roads, 214, my, uh, our, our middle son went to Summit um, for pretty much from the time he was kindergarten through eighth grade or first grade through eighth grade. And uh, coming here, I mean, it's, it's difficult. It's a dangerous road. We would drive it every day. Making that left-hand turn can be uh, harrowing. We certainly need to get that road widened. Um, it's, a, it's a big goal of mine to get that on the high priority list for state funding um, if I'm elected so that we can have it widened at least to have emergency vehicles um, be able to get down. Um, so these are sort of the things that I would focus on. I do, on the schools, I do believe we need to have additional smaller schools. And I think on a countywide basis, that needs to be a high priority. Thank you. So, Ms. Aaron, you can hold the microphone. Uh, uh, you both have talked about the need to expand infrastructure through roads, increase schools, mm -hmm. and also to control the development. With the limited ability of the budget, where do you intend to find the money? So I have a couple of interesting ideas because I, I believe that we can do a lot of this without raising taxes. That is a big piece of my campaign. Um, I've been speaking to a few different people, and one of, I'll give you one idea actually today. Um, they've done this successfully in the city of Annapolis, and I think we could use it really well um, in the county. They have put a solar park, a solar energy park, on a landfill in the city of Annapolis. It's otherwise unusable land. You don't see it. They, it's a public-private partnership in a way, so um, an independent private company comes in to build the, the solar panels that they put on the landfill and they lease the land from the city. So they actually pay the city for this privilege. And then the city gets to use the solar energy at a steep discounted rate, so the city also saves money on its electricity bills. Now the county auditor has done an audit of the, of the, um, the benefit to the city on that landfill. Um, a certain number should be coming out soon, but roughly they're estimating about $250,000 a year for the city. Now. That is only, uh, I believe, 100 acres of solar. We've got 10 times that because we've got way more landfills. We have three or four landfills that we could put this on easily. So we could actually do 10 times that in Anne Arundel County and generate that much more money every year. That much more money every year going towards capital projects and infrastructure improvements would, would go a long way. I think we could do things like this. We could do um, you know, forest management practices and things like that. Actually, Envision Mayo had put on a, a program about that not too long ago. Um, we had a great presenter there who, who talked about these forestry management tactics that can actually generate income for the county. I think there are things that we can do like that that would be an alternative to raising taxes and would allow us to improve the infrastructure in the county. Mr. Kitchens. All right, so this is literally the million dollar question, right? Like, how do you pay for everything? Um, and, and there's not an easy answer to that, and I think as adults we can all like, start with that, but sometimes we just have to make really hard decisions. But one, I think you do start with trying to get rid of waste, fraud, and abuse in, in anything, right? And so the best way to do that is to let loose the county auditor on the budget every single year. So the county charter says that the budget, um, the department heads have to turn their proposed budget to the county executive 120 days in advance of the end of the fiscal year. And then the county executive has to turn around and give the budget, his proposed budget, to the county council with 60 days. But there's nowhere in there where it says when the county executive has to give his budget to the county auditor. So this year through the county audit, the county auditor got it about the same time the county council did. She ran a quick report. She found about $9.5 million of waste in Steve Shoe's budget. About $4.2 million of that was operating budget, reoccurring savings we could have every single year. And she said, I did not have time to run a full report because of when I was given the budget. So the first thing we have to do is legislatively say, like, look, you have to get the budget information to the auditor with enough time for them to do that. And so you eliminate waste, fraud, and abuse. We do look for creative ways to find more money. But if you look at the math, we're still going to have really hard decisions to make. You're not going to make a million dollars off a landfill and, and solve the infrastructure needs. So we have to, do have to find a way to gener generate some revenue. And one, I would start with raising impact fees on developers to their full costs. So we charge them about 80% right now of their costs when they build projects. We both just talked about how a lot of the infrastructure needs come from being overdeveloped. And we are literally, literally subsidizing that development. 
And so we raise those, those fees. That generates a lot more money right there. And then we look for other things. When I, my family visits my wife's family in California, we pay a tax on the rental car. And, and it's high. And I pay it because my car is in Baltimore and I'm in San Diego, right? So there's a way we could get money also out of people visiting us that would not be a burden on taxpayers that live here. We have, we have a question from a um, member of the audience who's from Crofton who's concerned about developers circumventing the codes through modifications and the adverse impact it's having on their community. What would you propose doing if you're elected to the council to address developers attempting to circumvent the code through modifications? Which is my first <clears throat> uh, Yes, your first one. Okay. All right, so this is, this is a big one. There's a couple things we need to do here. And, and some of them is, is closing the loopholes that are in the county code. But we, first of all, should just never allow a modification for having a public meeting. So developers throughout the process, they're supposed to have public meetings with the communities. And since 2015, since Steve Shee took office, they have waived more than 530 community meetings. Like, I don't, I don't, like, that should just not be allowed. There should be nothing that allows that kind of a modification, right? So there are some modifications that we should just completely outlaw, and they tried to tighten that up a little bit um, in the spring, and they did not go far enough. There are still loopholes a, a mile wide where those meetings could still be waived if somebody wanted to. Two, we need to give the county council a little bit more power vis-a-vis -vis the county executive when it comes to other things. There are both on the Enclave Project in, in Crofton, on Turtle Run, down, down here in South County, you literally have the county lawyer working with the developer's council as a co-counsel for developers to try to help them figure out how to wiggle their way around the county code. The county lawyer should be the people's lawyer. They should be helping us push back and making sure that the developers are actually following the law that we've written. But right now, the county council has no authority to approve who the county executive picks as the county lawyer. And so we need to, we need to be able to take that power and we need to get, have advise consent power over who the county lawyer actually is, and then we can make the county lawyer work for us as, a part, as opposed to working for the developers. And then, again, there are just other ways we can tighten up the code to where these modifications would, would be so much harder to push through. But if things were more transparent because community meetings could not be waived, and if we could trust the county government apparatus was actually working for us and not working for the developers, I think that would go a long way to help with the problem of these ridiculous modifications. Thank you. So there's two, well we agree on one thing and that is that you shouldn't be able to waive a public hearing. I, I agree with that. I think that's something that needs to certainly um, be closed. The second thing I think we can do really is expand the time frame for advance notice to the public and expand the number of people that you give notice to. Because a lot of times what happens is people say, well, I didn't even know this was happening. They didn't get the notice because the requirement is only, you know, X number of feet from the center of where they, and you know, they creatively measure where they're going to actually measure the distance from and so you get the minimum number of people. Um, I saw this actually down in, in South County where someone was wanting to get a, a, a modification and, and the notice that they had to give really, by the time they had measured, was you know, one person. Um, and so we need, to, we need to make sure that that gets further expanded, particularly in areas where uh, you know, your neighbors are not quite as close. Um, I think with those two pieces in mind, we'll have better community input and that allows the county to make better decisions with the community involvement. Um, there are other loopholes, like I spoke about, where I, um, you know, you should not be able to switch from an age restricted to a non-age restricted without a public hearing. Those are things; those are small things. As an attorney, I currently do government contract litigation. These are things that I have um, seen as an engineer. I've seen zoning issues. I've seen modification issues. I've seen these things. I know firsthand kind of where some of the problems lie on a practical matter and, and ways that I think we can make them um, better and how to draft the language to do it. So I think that I could be really effective in helping with some of this stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Harry, you can hold the microphone. Sure, this is the next question. Many of our senior citizens feel that it is becoming impossible to continue to live in the county of retirement. Between the tax burden and the lack of transportation options to help them when they can no longer drive, they feel they're being forced to move just to be able to retire comfortably. What would you do as a member of the council to make it easier for seniors to retire in the county? So there's two things that I think would, would be 
helpful for retirees. And actually, this is I've heard this comment quite a bit. Some of this comes um, actually at the state level, and some of it comes at the county level. Um, I do know that Delegate Seth Howard and um, the, the candidate Ron George have been pushing pretty significantly to lower or eliminate um, taxes on retirement income entirely in the state, and I think that that would be a huge help. So I'm fully supportive of that. I would definitely like to push for that on that. On that. The transportation side is something that I think we can help a little bit more with on the county council. Um, I know there's been several proposals and, and it is a widespread issue. We actually were both just at a uh, community meeting um, for ACT and Arundel connecting together and one of their big, they have six or seven prongs of things that they're looking to do and one of the big ones is transportation. It affects not only retirees, but also people trying to get to court up in Annapolis or people trying to get to work in Annapolis or elsewhere. Um, I, I think bus service is the um, probably most uh, easily facilitated at this time, um, although we don't have bus lanes and whatnot. So we really, I mean, that's something we need to put our, our heads together and think about it. But I think that that's the area where the county council can make the biggest difference is trying to make sure we have adequate bus service. Mr. Kitchen. Um. Yeah, so transportation is a huge issue, as is retiring here. I remember growing up, my grandfather, that was, that was a big thing. He lived on a fixed income. They had waterfront property on the South River, and he would fight with the county tax office over and over and over. He was like, my, my income is not growing, but my tax bill is. Like, what am I supposed to do, right? So I've seen my family live through that here, and I think that's absolutely one of the areas where we need to look at making tax burden for, for seniors in retirement a little bit lower, but we have to be willing to figure out where, where the money's gonna come from to make up for that because like we're not just gonna like cut taxes and then increase your transportation at the same time. Those two things don't don't really go together. Like we are constrained by the realities of accounting and math. And and so that is always something that we're gonna have to keep in mind. I do think in South County we need targeted bus bus services, right? And so we just have the South County circular that was put in. And I went and rode that the other day with a group of seniors and, and it was it was great. It was awesome. Uh, not everyone on it was seniors, but uh, um, it, it, it was it was a a good program, and we need to give that a chance to work. So that has a loop starts in Annapolis Mall, comes down as a loop around South County, and then there's two zonal shuttles that you can call ahead of time. And they'll pick you up at your house and they'll take you to a bus stop, and it's only a dollar. And so those kinds of programs absolutely need to work. What's the problem we have right now, where we're trying to give more services? And, and we have an administration and a team that, that is, we're going to cut taxes, cut taxes, cut taxes, but we're also going to increase your services. And sometimes we end up robbing Peter to pay Paul. And so we created the South County Circulator, but the way we did that is, is taking service away from the seniors trying to the senior center in, in Edgewater, right? And, and that is absolutely ridiculous. We cannot create a, a new service without finding a way to pay for that. And we, we should not create a new service and, and have you know, a press release where we're talking about how great this thing is we created when we created that by, by hurting other citizens over here. Um, that is just not the way government should work. And if I'm on the county council, we'll try to find a way to do that without hurting, you know, helping one group of citizens by hurting another group of senior citizens. Thank you, Mr. Kitt, you can hold the microphone. Um, one of the questions tonight came from a resident who was concerned that the Liquor Board recently approved a license to a business in the peninsula and their concerns about its impact on the community, on public safety, on traffic, and their feeling that they didn't get an adequate opportunity to be engaged. How would you increase the public's involvement in not development in the sense of buildings, but development and economic development that has an adverse impact on the community? On the community? Yep. Um. Yes, that's a really good question. But I, I think you do it a, a lot the same way. Like you go after, as a public policy researcher, we look at like where are the power nodes in the system, right? And, and, and how do people get around things? I think you go after the money that, that people get in, into the system and, and you incentivize government to actually work for people. And so if you're gonna get a liquor license, you should have the same kind of public application process and, and we need to get rid of the modifications. We need to make sure that that is transparent. We need to make sure that you know that the advanced notification is there, that everyone's going to be affected, is notified. Um, but it does all link to develop. It might not be the same one, but I know that there, there are other businesses on the peninsula that got a liquor license, but they only got it because there was a last-minute amendment 
at the comp rezoning bill last time that upzoned that property that allowed it to happen. And so it is somewhat linked to the general development plan and to the comp rezoning that, that is coming up. But look, we need to make sure that government works for people, and then we need to make sure that there is a, a very transparent process that allow people to be involved and to have a say in economic development decisions in, in their communities. Thank you. Ms. Hare. Uh, I do think this comes back actually to the general development plan full swing. This is where the communities, you know, we're, we're right now, I know, um, you know, the Citizens Advisory Board are, is meeting, the Citizens Advisory Committee, I'm sorry, is meeting and going over, you know, how the last small area plans were or were not implemented. How is public safety going according to the last general development plan? They're doing all of this research. We're going to get all kinds of proposals going forward and this is where the community gets this input. We need to make sure the community has this input so that the zone zoning areas where someone may be able to get a liquor license is got community buy-in from the get-go because it's incorporated into the general development plan and the comprehensive rezoning the way the community wants it to be. So I do think that's how we that's how we get in there in the first place. Um, okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh, you can hold the microphone. So Listening, the audience listening to the questions and the answers came up with a question with regard to the proposal to increase infrastructure, to increase roads, to advance public safety. In cases like the Mayo Peninsula, where you only have the one main road in and out, how do you ensure that a safer road does not become a justification for increased development? So I think there's two things at play here. Um, just because an ambulance can get down the peninsula or a fire truck can get down the peninsula doesn't mean the peninsula has the capacity to hold additional residents. We're, we're making it meet the safety requirements for the residents. We're not saying it's open for additional development. I think those are two distinctions that we need to make. The, the reason why the road is partly unsafe right now is because it is one road in and one road out. And if there's an accident, and you can't get an ambulance down here, it's not safe for anybody. Um, so widening the road doesn't suddenly mean, oh, just kidding, we can, we can have a million more people. There's other things you have to look at. You have to look at the aquifer, the, you know, the studies that are coming out and all of that, and whether we can handle that. You have to look at what happens by cutting down additional trees and the erosion and sediment control that increases from that, and whether there's going to be additional flooding. There's a lot of other things you have to look at when deciding whether um, an area can handle additional residents. Um, so I certainly don't mean to suggest that simply by widening the road it makes the Mayo Peninsula open for more development. Rather, I'm suggesting it makes it safer for the existing residents and perhaps even a spot for you to have a bike, a bike lane where people can bike up and down and get to the, the beaches and whatnot who live here. Thank you. Mr. Kitch. So I, I agree that having a road, <laughs> we should be able to have safe roads and zoning that complies with what our communities want. That should not be something that we're worried about. The reason we're worried about it is because of how this government has run, how this county has been run for the past you know, decade after decade after decade, and, and we've got to stop. But we have to fundamentally fix that system. You should not have to choose between safe ambulance service or quick ambulance service and, and less development on the Mayo Peninsula. And so that's the thing you have to look at. The GDP and the comprehensive rezoning bill that, that will come after that it is really what's going to control that. If we don't zone it for more development, then the more development is not going to happen. And we can downzone things if we want to to ensure things aren't going to happen. But, but really, it, it's who do you trust to go after the developer's money and, and, and to not allow them to have the power to force in more developments once that, that road is wider. And I would say that person is probably me. I have not taken a dime from developers at all through this entire process. I made that decision before I started running because this was a big issue for me and for my family and for the building going on in our community too. And I wanted everyone to be able to trust that I'm going to be on the side of the communities, not the side of developers bankrolling uh, my campaign. Ms. Harris talked a couple times about how we should close the loophole for age-restricted housing to shift and, and then become you know, full family housing once full capacity gets happened. She's taken thousands of dollars from the, the development that has made that happen in my own community. You look at Two Rivers in Crofton, and they're the ones that did that, and I would put forward to you, like, who do you trust to be on your side and to push back harder against the developers? I have taken none of their money. They don't have any of my loyalties, and that was a very conscious decision that I made 
the beginning of my campaign. Mr. Kitchen. Immigrants in the current political environment has created a lot of fear in this community, which helps to breed crime and isolation. What would you do if you're elected to the council to address that? So there's a couple things. Um, absolutely, this is this is very enable them to interact with us in the way that they want to. And so if we are funding our schools in a way that that exclude this community because of the language that they speak, then we are isolating them. So one is really looking at support services in our schools, making sure we have ESL teachers for the students, making sure that we have translators so that parents can actually interact with the school administration and their kids' teachers in a way that is, that is necessary. And then two, we're involved in a couple of, of programs at the county level that, that are just plain wrong and that treat immigrants very, very poorly and that open up the county to liability. So we have this 287G program where any time an immigrant comes into contact with the correction officers, they don't have not had to commit a crime, they not have to be a violent crime, they don't have to be a probable cause where they could be held, but we run their um, background, and if ICE might want to come look at them for a civil infraction, we're talking civil immigration infraction, not criminal, not anything, then we'll hold them for an extra 48 hours to let the, the feds come and look at them. Counties throughout the country have been sued for violating people's civil rights for unlawful detention, so it's a huge liability to the taxpayers that we're exposing ourselves to, and it creates large amounts of distrust amongst the immigrant community. Because it's like, look, any time we come into contact, like, we have then the, the threat of you know, going through this process and possibly getting deported, when again, these people have not committed crimes. And anyone who told me differently that, that the program works differently just doesn't understand what the program is. This is part of what I've studied. But these are the communities we need to work with them to, to stop crime in those communities and not have policies on books that actively alienate them to where we then can't work with them. Thank you. Ms. Sarah. So um, in terms of the, let's talk in two parts, certainly. The, the, the people who are here and need help with services of ESL, et cetera. Actually, the, um, the girl I work with in foster care right now, her mother speaks no English at all. Um, I spent a summer doing volunteer work in Honduras uh, about 20 years ago um, and speak a decent amount of Spanish at this point, so I've been able to communicate with the mom. But it is a very difficult situation that this girl, the, the daughter speaks perfect English and she's in, in high school here and whatnot, but um, it is a very difficult situation that the mom, when she has to go to court and whatnot, we need a translator for her and whatnot. We need to make sure that those services are in place, that she certainly has the ability to talk with her daughter and, and make sure that she's understanding all the court proceedings and, and how all of that's going. That is certainly something the county needs to address. On the other side, on the public safety side, um, our state's attorney has prosecuted a number of MS-13 gang members. Um, if they are here illegally, I fully support that they be removed. If they've been convicted MS-13 members and they've committed um, significant violent crimes, I believe that we, we should um, send them back. It's it's expensive to keep them here from a taxpayer standpoint, and they've committed, they've committed a violent crime, I don't believe that they should be allowed to stay. Thank you. Ms. Here. Can I follow up on that a little bit? Uh, Are we allowed to you can in closing, Mark, but we're just okay. going back. Okay. Ms. Here. We have been losing teachers and struggling to hire new teachers due to the pay comparisons between Anne Arundel and other counties. What would you propose to do to fix that? We certainly need to increase uh, salaries. In fact, I had a long conversation. I spoke to the South County Rotary Club not too long ago, and there was a teacher in the audience. I had a long conversation with her because um, the steps are not increasing fast enough. Uh, it's my understanding that quite a bit ago during the previous administration when uh, we had the recession, um, there, were, there was sort of an agreement that step increases would be on hold in exchange for no layoffs. That time has ended. We need to increase the salaries. Um, there's been a, a number of articles that, that show that we are behind um, our neighboring uh, jurisdictions and that we are losing teachers to, to other jurisdictions, and, and that's troubling, uh, particularly when our class sizes are so large. Um, other than raising the salaries, I'm not sure that there's something specific you can say. Um, obviously, compensation is a full package. Benefits that can be offered may also help to um, increase teacher retention. It's certainly something the county needs to take a look at. 
Um, and if we can find some, some wasteful spending in other areas that we can shift back into the classroom, that would certainly be a priority. No, I think this, this is one of the biggest things that we face as a county right now is that our teachers are under, underpaid compared to the rest of the counties around us. And the step issue, you know, it's both a, comp a competitive issue and it's, you know, an equity issue as well. Like we have teachers that were here during the recession and were loyal and didn't get paid for five or six years, did not get those increases, and then we're hiring new teachers now and we're giving them the amount of steps of, of the number of years that they've taught. And so we're hiring new teachers into the county. They're getting paid more than more experienced teachers that have been in the county longer. Like, what does that do to teacher morale? Like, this is absolutely one of the things we have to fix. Like, a good society is built on, you know, strong public education. And the backbone of strong public education like, really is our teachers. And we have created a situation where our teachers... You know, the, the morale is low because, because of this, this pay disparity, both between us and other counties, and even in, in the same departments, in the same schools, in the same, same school system. And that is absolutely something that we need to do. That will be a, a big priority of mine if I get on the county council. And, and again, like, as someone who's taught, like, I understand how, how that would feel um, to be paid less than a less experienced person you know, that just got hired. Um, again, this is one of the reasons that, that the teachers are, are backing me. It's because they know that I'm going to be that advocate for it. And, and again, I haven't, I'm not promising you on, on one hand that I'm going to increase services and on the other hand promise you that I'm going to cut your taxes. Like, I, I, I'm not going to do that because I understand that sometimes in public policy we just have to be adults and have real conversations. You know, I am in my mid-30s. I do not remember a political campaign ever where someone did not promise to me that they were going to increase my services and cut my taxes at the same time. And I'm just kind of sick of it. Like, I don't... I, I just am. Um, you can't do it all. That's going to be a huge priority for me. And so we're going to have to like cut services huge somewhere else, or we're going to have to look up revenue. But teachers are going to get paid. That's going to happen. Okay. Okay. Mr. Kitchen, as you traveled around the district, what issue have voters raised to you that you were not aware of when you began your campaign, and how would you address it? So the two issues for me um, would be transportation, which we've already talked about a little bit. Um, I've just not been in, in that situation myself, and, and so that has been very interesting. I've learned a lot in, in that way. But we've, we've dealt with that one already. The other one would be water access. Um, that's an interesting issue. I grew up in this district, but you know my grandparents have property on the South River, my uncle on the Severn River. Um, like I always could drive 10 or 15 minutes and you know be in the water. And I just kind of assumed that that's how it was in Anne Arundel County. We all had an uncle or an aunt or like a grandparent or someone where like you could enjoy the, the rivers and the bay and everything that was here. And I understand that, that that is not true. And people have talked to me a lot about water access. And that's something that we do need to move forward on. But the way we do it matters. And the way the county is trying to do it now is absolutely the wrong way. Like it's okay to push water access, but not at the expense of the communities that, that live around where you're trying to point people to. Like, you have to build infrastructure first. Absolutely have to. And this is where I really think we need public-private partnerships. I talked with a gentleman in Galesville that works at a marina in, in Shadyside that is losing business because Team Shu built this public boat ramp and is leasing the space. And there is a, a marina that has a boat ramp literally right across the street. And they're like, we are now losing business because you created this other one. And so we have the government coming in and taking business away from small business owners in our county in the name of water access. We should go and we should subsidize those small businesses. We should give them grants. We should help them do the work that they're already doing to where we can spur water access and you know, not create new infrastructure, just boondoggles, and, you know, and do those things at the same time. So it is important. That's an issue that I was not as aware of. Um, but I do think the way the current administration is handling it is, is in the wrong direction. Thank you. Ms. Hare. So I would say actually the biggest issue that I was not initially aware of is a lot of this erosion control problems we're seeing um, around the county. When we spoke at the Edgewater Beach um, candidate forum, I spoke afterwards with several people there who had mentioned how far back the beach has gotten there and how difficult it is now and all the flooding that happens as a result of that. I know that we've spoken many times it, you know, at the Mayo candidate fora and the different meetings here that there's erosion problems on, on the beaches. Um, 
I do think a lot of this is tied to development. I do think that this is something that we need to take a hard look at at the general development plan level and the comprehensive rezoning. Um, but it was certainly something that took me a little bit by surprise. We don't live on the water, and I didn't have kind of daily interaction with it from um, a resident standpoint. And so that was something that certain, certainly took me by surprise. Um, I knew somewhat about the uh, response times for ambulance, uh, but I didn't know that there's a number of places where it's a problem. Um, here on the Mayo Peninsula, obviously, but I did discover um, during the campaign about the um, issues down in Rose Haven, this, this road that they're trying to raise um, because of the flooding. The proposals coming from the State Highway Administration require essentially closing a significant bridge for a two-year time frame. And that will take the emergency response times from four minutes to 15 minutes because they have to go around. I think this is enormously unacceptable. And from an engineering standpoint, I have seen a number of roads where you can phase it. You can do one lane at a time. You have single way traffic. You can allow the ambulances to go through. There's plenty of areas to do staging for equipment and whatnot. And I can certainly tell you as a county council uh, candidate and as a, as a county councilman that those types of safety uh, issues would be a large priority for me. And I would definitely push back on stuff like that. Ms. Hare, when it comes to violence in our schools and the discussion turns to guns, the discussion often deadlocks. What would you do to advance the discussion? What's the next point? I hope I, hope I answer the question. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, but I, would, I personally would like to see um, school resource officers, not just in the high schools and the middle schools, but also in the elementary schools. They've been critical um, to defending some of, the, some of the problems. I think that that's really one area where we can certainly diffuse some of the situations. Um, in terms of talking about it, I think the most important thing we can do is, I mean, have an open and frank conversation. People may disagree, but it's important to listen to everyone. As a, as a county councilman, I think our biggest job is to listen. The residents and the communities, you are the people that we serve. And whether I start out thinking one thing, but then talk to a community and realize this is really what they want and what they need and this is the community buy-in, that's an important part of our job, but probably the most important part of our job. Um, so I would really like to see SROs, not just in the high schools and middle schools, but also in the elementary schools. And then really I'd like to have a conversation with all of you about what you think about these things. Yeah, so um, specifically like safety in schools, you yeah, know, that, that is, a huge issue, like whether you have a child, a grandparent, you just live near a school, anything. Like we need our kids to be safe and our kids to feel safe when they're in schools. Um, I agree that the SROs, it is a direction that, that we're going in. Um, the research on it shows that they, in some situations, they're pretty effective. We need to make sure we monitor those really well because in other situations, um, studies have shown that SROs cause more discipline problems within a school. And so if we're gonna move in that direction, we need to make sure that we're giving the school system the, the tools to monitor what's happening with SROs so that we don't create you know, more of a, of a school to prison pipeline and we're not creating more discipline issues in a school by having um, armed officers presence there. Um, so yes, we can move forward in that direction and honestly we, we have to, whether or not either of us think about it, the General Assembly just passed a bill saying that within a few years every county has to show that they have an SRO, high school, middle school, um, elementary school. And, and so that is definitely the direction the state's moving in. And so the county needs to make sure that as that gets implemented, we're making sure it's implemented in a way that is not um, increasing equity, inequities in discipline um, within the schools. Beyond that, a huge part of the safety of a school is the climate in a school. We need more psychologists. We need more social workers. We need more counselors. Um, my daughter's school has one counselor for 750 odd kids. And she's also the testing coordinator. And, and, and so it's like, how often is she actually counseling the students that go to my kid's school um, versus you know, there are, are, are entire months of the year where she's not at all. So this past year, the school board asked for $3 million to increase staffing for those three positions, psychologists, social workers, and counselors. And the county executive gave them none completely, but had $15 million to, to put into other safety things like um, bulletproof doors and metal detectors and, and, and things like that, right? So other upgrades, which are necessary, but I think he just likes to build things. Um, and there needs to be more of a balance um, be between public safety infrastructure and um, supporting your kids in other ways. Okay. Mr. Kidd. Okay. Mr. Kidd. 
Mr. Kitchen. Yes. On the Mayo Peninsula, the county executive has proposed developing five separate parks, which, when complete, will equate to one fifth of the total landmass of the peninsula and add 1,100 parking spots, plus or minus. Where do you think the county council can engage on that to address citizens' concerns about crowding and over, the, the traffic and, and safety issues that come from it? Right. So that's, that's a really important question. And there's a handful of things that I think that we need to do about that. And the county council is going to have a lot of say in that, especially with the next general development plan in comprehensive rezoning. But first, there's a big loophole that basically says that, that public development is exempted from adequate public facilities. So if a private developer were going to build that park, they would have to do like, you know, these traffic studies and they couldn't build if, if you know, the traffic infrastructure couldn't be um, in increased. Public things are things like the school board, public developments, they don't have to go through the same kind of adequate public facility process, and that is absolutely ridiculous. If we're requiring a private citizen to go this process to build it, we should require the same things as the government. That would help a lot um, with the issues on the, on the peninsula. I think what we ultimately need is a peninsula overlay zoning designation for all the peninsulas, not just Mayo, that make those things much harder, that have tighter adequate public facilities um, like that, like, like saying, okay, at least on peninsulas, if you're going to build a school, if you're going to build a park, you have to go through this adequate public facility process. I think we should also say, you know, those parking spaces, whichever one should be there, should be built with the, the um, pervious pavers um, anywhere possible to where they have less of an environmental impact. And yes, that's going to be more expensive, and you know what that'll do is, is it'll make it smaller. Um, so it'll be less parking places, but there'll be parking places that are more environmentally friendly. Um, that's something we should require in a peninsula overlay zoning. And I'd also want to designate Beverly Triton Park and South River Farm Park as the nature preserves that they should be. Um, yes, the public should have access to them, but I want to take my, my daughter there and have her look at the bubble eagles and, and see the nature like as it's supposed to be, not go out there and sit on a beach. We can do that somewhere else. And so I think we need to redesignate those two parks and just make sure we're following the state's critical area laws. Like those are RCA, the, the um, resource conservation areas, they are only supposed to be for passive recreation, and we're trying to put big things in there that would encourage active recreation, and we need to not do that. Thank you. Ms. Hare. Thank you. So this one is, is pretty close to me because, um, as I said, I live not too far away from here, just at 2 and 2.14, and I go running at Beverly Triton Park sometimes. I love how quiet it is when I go there and how untouched it is, and, and that's incredible to me. Um, the county executive and I have had several conversations about his plans for uh, these parks, and in no uncertain terms, I have told him a couple of times <laughs> uh, certain things that I, I just think should not happen. The parking spaces is a huge one. Um, they really need to be lower in scale. I have never had trouble um, getting to one of the parks and being able to go running and whatnot. We do not need you know, 97 spots at this place and, and whatnot. Um, I, I just think it's, it's unreasonable. Um, we certainly agree, and I've been pushing the pervious surface for quite some time, particularly in light of all the erosion and sediment control problems that we're having. It is nonsense to put an impervious surface um, there when the pervious surface will, will do a much better job. Um, I've also had conversations with him about, for example, bathrooms down by the beach is nonsense. Uh, we don't need that. Um, certainly not all the way down by the beach. Uh, you can, for sure, if you really need to have bathrooms of some kind, put composting toilets that, that are, are farther back, et cetera. Um, I think the biggest thing that we need to do is make sure that the future traffic study is done. It, to have a traffic study, we need to make sure that it, you know, there's no sort of voodoo going on with it. That they're considering all peak times, when school gets out, on the weekends, during rush hour, everything. Um, and that we really make sure we account for future traffic proposed by these parks when we are looking at ambulance service and, um, and, and other necessary response times before we even allow X number of parking spaces for additional people to be down on the peninsula. Thank you. Ms. Hare, do you think is least effective and why? Oh gosh, you're asking this to an attorney? I might go with the court system sometime. Um, <laughs> so, um, gosh, I would like to think, maybe this is a little bit idealistic, but I would like to think when everybody's working together, all parts of the government have their say. We, the checks and balances should work. Um, when the county executive proposes something in his budget that is 
wasteful, the county council should be, you know, checking that, and the county auditor should be checking that. When a law is passed that's, you know, it should get challenged if it's if it's not proper. Um, I, I would like to think that really everybody working together and everybody working across the aisle um, really should be able to hum on all cylinders. I, I think a lot of times, particularly as of late, um, the partisan nature of a lot of politics makes it such that at the county council level, at the state legislature level, um, things don't work. I, I would like to think that um, I can have a conversation with anyone, with my opponent, right? He's not my enemy, he's my opponent. But we have some ideas that are similar, some ideas that are different. And I, you know, I, I think the most interesting point on this is that my opponent in the primary has come forward to fully support me now in the general. Um, we had differences of opinion in the primary, but we can work together now. And I think that if we can bring that to the county council, we will have a very effective uh, next four years on, in all areas of government. Mr. Kitchen. Yeah, I would, I would like to think that government could all work together too, but it doesn't. Um, and it's not at all how Anne Arundel County works right now. I would say the least um, efficient part of the government right now, the county government, if we're talking about, is the Office of Planning and Zoning and the way development happens. Um, that is absolutely the, the worst part of our county government right now. And I think that the reason it happens is because of Again, the, the developers own the house. It's because of the power that they have in the political system. And if we're not willing to go after that power, then we're not going to actually fix the problem at its root cause. And it's going to keep on going, and it's going to keep on going. And look, Steve Shue knows that this is <laughs> the worst part of the government right now, too. He's come out in the last year and has tried to pass all these bills to make it look like he's really good on development. But again, there's either huge loopholes in them, or they've been written to where they're going to expire right after the election. Um, and again, why is that done? We know what the answer is to school capacity. They wrote the bill, and they wrote the bill to expire after the election because of the power and the political process that the developers have. And so that is, you know, there's a lot to want for in Anne Arundel County government. Again, I study government for a living. I study local governments. Um, and so there's examples all over the country of ways that things can work better. And there's good things about Anne Arundel County government too. There are things that we do well. Um, planning is absolutely not one of them. Um, that's the one that we really have to look at fixing. And again, you do that by fundamentally shifting the power dynamics in the county government level. And you cannot do that if you don't go after the, the influence and the power of the developers' monies by them. And you can't do that if your campaign's been bankrolled by developers. You just can't. Mr. Kitchen. Whichever one of you is next elected on the council will face the general development plan when it is presented. What are you going to insist upon before you vote to approve it? What I'm going to in insist upon in the general development plan is, one, that there has been some sort of audit of all the different small area plans, and we see what was ignored, and that those things get included into the general development plan. So I'm going to insist on that. Like, where, where are we with what the community said that they wanted um, you know, in the early 2000s? And, and what has been ignored? And, and where do we still need to move forward on those? So that's one of the things I'm going to insist on as, as far as, as that goes. And then two, just community input. Like, we're going to take that plan, and I'm going to insist on, on enough time to, to go to communities, to hold town halls, and be like, hey, is this what your communities want? Um, this process has been not included you know, re-looking at all the small areas. It, it's been incredibly fast, and it has not taken the amount of time and the amount of public input into it as it should have had. I, I went to a handful of the general development, like, planning sessions, and we put stickers on, on things on the wall. Um, and it's, like, cool that they asked for some input, but it, but it was nowhere near enough. So I'm going to insist that, that the process was, or if it wasn't, be extended to where I can be sure that there was adequate public input into it and that it re-looked at um, the small area plans and, and, and make sure that we're making up for the, the issues that we ignored. And I hope there's a question on comp rezoning because there's a lot I'm going to require on comprehensive rezoning ordinance as well because that's really where, where the power is, right? Like we're told that the general development plan is just this plan, but there's no teeth to it. It's, like it's not a law. It's just like it's there. And what is the law and what has to be followed is actually comp rezoning, which comes out of the general development plan. 
And that, we do have to make sure we have a good general development plan, but we also absolutely have to make sure that that comp rezoning bill, that that process is done well. The last time it absolutely was not. I have a lot of good ideas on how we can fix that process this time. Thank you. Ms. Hare. Two major things. Exhaustive information on the adequacy of our current infrastructure and exhaustive information on how our current uh, development and zoning compares with the general development plan that was done in 2009. I want to know exactly how we got where we are now from where we were planning on being and I think if we can look at those steps we'll know either exactly where we went right and where we went wrong. And that exhaustive information is going to let us know whether we're taking the right path for the current general development plan. And, and I say all this, I have certainly taken money from developers, absolutely. My campaign finance reports are public, they're out there. I, I'm not going to hide from that. I answer to you, each and every one of you, no differently than I answer to somebody who's given me $1, $1,000, it doesn't matter. I will pick up the phone anytime any of you call me. My personal cell phone, my, the email that I answer personally is back there. I encourage all of you to please give me a call, send me an email. Anytime somebody has written me, called me, I have, I have answered to the best of my ability um, you know, as quickly as humanly possible. Uh, and, and I think that my experience makes me the best person to be able to look at these issues and understand from an infrastructure standpoint whether we've done what we wanted to do or we haven't, where we're missing things, and to be able to quickly identify areas for improvement. Okay, this here. This here. How do you define carrying capacity, and do you think it should be a factor in guiding or limiting development? How do I define carrying capacity, and do I think it should certainly be a, a, a factor? Um, I mean, the, the, the carrying capacity of any area or any development is it's a combination of the adequate public facilities. It's a combination of the other issues that are already there. It's, it's what an area can withstand. Um, and, and that's not just one easy thing, but that looks at a variety of factors depending on where you are in the county and what's unique to your situation. Um, whether school overcrowding is a big issue in your area or whether it's an aquifer that's being drawn down on. These are different things and you, you combine them to get um, sort of your total answer. Okay, Sketch. Yeah, the, the carrying capacity, repeat the question as it regards to development? Sure. Well, how do you define carrying capacity and do you think it should be a factor in guiding or in development? <laughs> So one, absolutely, it should be a factor in guiding development. That, that should just be a no-brainer, right? Um, but we do have to understand what the carrying capacity is, and there are a lot of different aspects to that. There are schools. Like, if that development gets built, it's going to add to our schools. If that development gets built, what does it do to our traffic infrastructure? What does it do to our environmental infrastructure? There is a carrying capacity for that as well, for our forests and for our trees, and, and how much development that the bay and the rivers can withstand. Um, there are our, our aquifers and the shallow wells and the septic systems. Like in the septic systems on the Mayo Peninsula, is there carrying capacity there to, to build more developments? And so it, it really is a whole host of things, um, you know, including schools, public safety infrastructure, traffic infrastructure, um, environmental concerns and, and infrastructure, and again, like water, septic, all those things should be part of a comparing capacity and it absolutely should guide whether or not we can do a development or whether we can't. We should not do a development. Okay. Okay. Mr. Kitchen, county developers are required to, play, to pay reforestation money for trees that are removed from the properties they seek to develop. Correct. How do you feel about that and how would you change it if you think it's wrong? Um, so there are a handful of things there. That, that, is, that is a very good question. Um, one, we need to strengthen the Forest Conservation Act as a whole. Right now, the state law says for every acre that gets cut down, we have to replant a quarter of an acre. And it needs to be at least a one-to-one -one capacity, but really we should be looking at the effects, like the environmental effects of it, and make sure that those are the same. Because if you cut down four acres of mature trees, you know, and replant four acres of saplings, you're not getting the same environmental effect. And so I want it to be a one-to-one -one as far as, you know, the environmental effects there. Developers can Instead of replanting, they can pay a fee and it goes into this fund. Um, 
And that whole system needs to be reformed. One, I think we need to raise that fee sum. But two, the, the county has you know, a forestry, Department of Forestry, that is housed within um, inspection and permits, is, is where it's at. And there have been years where the budget of the reforestation fund has been about $600,000, and 500000 of it goes to paying the salaries of the people that work there. So we actually would not have a forestry department if we didn't cut down the forests because we're literally paying for the forest department by cutting down the forest. Um, it is absolutely bizarre, but that's one of the ways that this administration and, and their team has been running this fiscal shell game. We've been cutting taxes and trying to tell you all that, that we're fiscally sound, but we're doing it by cutting down trees. It's like, well, what are we gonna do if we don't cut down trees? We're not gonna be able to hire those four or five you know, people that work in, in the county reforestation. So we need to look at that fee. If we're gonna, take, there are times where the fee makes sense, where the county, if we were doing it right, could do a better job planting those trees than the developer could doing it on their own. Um, so I'm not opposed to having it be there, but it needs to be much, much more stringent. It needs to be separated from from the overhead of actually running that department. Like we should not, you know, so the question should not be do we save our foresters or do we save our, our trees? Like we should be able to have both. Um, and, and the money we get from cutting down trees should go to planting trees, not paying for a county. Budgets. Thank you. We actually mostly agree on this one. I do think that you, if you cut down a, an acre of trees, you should have to plant an acre of trees. If you are paying for an acre of trees, the money should go to an acre of trees. Um, that being said, I think there are some other things that we can also do. Um, instead of clear cutting an acre of trees, let's make it that if you are building a house or two homes, you only cut down the handful of trees that need to be cut down. If somebody comes in and they're and they're going to cut trees, you should really have to make a showing of why these mature trees need to come down for whatever it is you're proposing to build. Um, I, I think the problem is all too often you come in and it's just, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna take everything. And that's not reasonable. And I think we need to, we need to make sure that that is something that gets um, stopped and, and prevented going forward. Thank you, Ms. Hare. Thank you, Ms. Hare. The quality of the water in our rivers and the bay continues to be a major concern. One solution might be to increase public access and involvement for people not living on the water. Alternatively, what other idea would you advance to increase public interest and support for better water quality? I think it's important that everyone take an interest in, I mean, this is where we live, right? Whether you live on the water or off the water, this is where we live. I think it's really important. Um, I think we get people involved by starting young. We start kids, middle school, high school, these are, you know, they already do some field trips to these areas, but I think some of the community service hours can be started with, um, you know, going to the West Road Riverkeeper and, and learning about that and doing some community cleanup efforts. Um, I think that's an interesting place to start. Uh, I think it helps get the communities involved. I mean, I know when my when our older daughter needed to do community service, I went and did it with her, um, and I learned a lot about what she was working on in that particular capacity. I think that's that would be a helpful way to get more communities involved. We have over 500 miles of shoreline, and certainly we need to uh, take care of it and take care of our rivers and and make sure that they last. Thank you. Good. Yeah. So. Again, we're, we're going to agree a lot on that. You do start young, just building interest. Uh, last Friday, I went with my kindergartner to one of those projects where we went to, to Downs Park on Pasadena, right on the bay. And, you know, we learned about trees and we learned about water and we learned about forests. Um, and, and so we are doing good things there. And certainly water access is, is another way. But I think one of the ways we increase interest in the water in the bay is modeling that interest as a government. And, and we have not done that. We do. We have 500... And, and 31 miles of shoreline or so. We have more shoreline than any county in the entire United States. Like we should be a leader on these issues. And right now we're not. Like the trees are the number one thing that we need to have clean water, to have clean rivers and a clean bay. I don't care how good of an engineer you are, like you're never gonna design something man-made that's gonna be as good for our rivers as a tree. Um, you're just not. We have been the second worst in the state for cutting down, for, for losing clear cutting forests to the forces of, of overdevelopment. We are the second worst. This has not been a priority for us. Um, we have actively used the county government and the county office of law to try to break 
and find loopholes in the Maryland critical area laws. Like, we've not been a leader in this. And so if we as a public, like the county council and the county government represents, in some real ways, just like the, the goals of, of the people as, as a whole, in our ideals and our statements, and we have not prioritized protecting the bay and protecting our, our, our rivers, and we can do that, um, and we need to. There's a reason why like, bay grasses are coming back throughout the bay, not at the same rate in Arrow County, because we are not doing a good enough job, and we could do it in a way that doesn't make environmentalists and, and the watermen butt heads. So we can, we can trust the watermen. They know the, the water better than any of us, and we can bring those people together, and, and we can you know, spur those maritime industries as well. So one of the big things we need to do is focus on strengthening our maritime industries and make sure they don't you know, go away in a generation. Mr. Kitchen. One of the jobs of a county administration, county government, is to look for the next generation of industry, the next generation of revenue for the county. Mm -hmm. What do you see as the next generation of industry that the county could focus on, and how would you foster it? That's a very good question. Um, I think it's going to be renewable energy. I think it's going to be the, the next generation of, of industry in, in this county, is we should become a leader in solar, and we should become a, a leader in you know, just like putting together like wind turbines and, and installing them and, you know, requiring, if we as a county can get up to the state mandated goals and renewable energy and, and lead on that, I think that's going to generate a whole lot of jobs and a whole lot of economic development in the county. And again, we should be leaders on this. We have more coastline than anyone else. Like this should be a top priority to us. We are going to be affected by sea level rise um, more than most jurisdictions in this country. Um, and so I think the sustainable energy is, is going to be really the next level, and I would definitely like like to work with the county council and the county executive in order to build incentives around those kind of industries, as opposed to the, the current incentives we do um, for the developers to, to clear cut our trees and do all those. We need to stop subsidizing that kind of development. We need to, or that kind of economic activity. We need to start subsidizing renewable economic activity, which I think we can do. But we also need to not just look to the future, we do also want to preserve both our, our farming industries and our maritime industries in Anne Arundel County, especially here in South County, and I think we can do all of that. So I think we, we definitely have to keep an eye on how do we keep and preserve some of these awesome things about our heritage that make Anne Arundel County what it is, while at the same time moving to the future with renewable energy as well. And I think that that can be done, and I'd be very happy to be a part of doing it. Thank you. Ms. Hare. Uh, this feeds right into the discussion that I started earlier today about the landfills and ways to use it. I think that this is a, a, a terrific area where the county can take the lead um, and we can show other parts of the state um, that, that we are a leader on this. Um, so that's certainly something I would like to, to get moving, um, particularly given the uh, revenue generation that it provides for the county as well. Um, could you read the question one more time? Sure. Just so it, it's what would you, what do you see as the next big industry or revenue generator for the county and how would you foster it? Yeah, so uh, I mean, I think really looking for those areas like landfills that cannot otherwise be used um, and, and really um, using those to our advantage to generate this type of, of energy and revenue for the county. Um, looking at things like the forestry management, these are ways where we can, in an environmentally sound fashion, move the county forward and, and generate revenue. Ms. Hare, according to the last numbers that the county has reported, the number of overdoses and deaths from opioids continues to increase and is running about an 18% fatality rate in Anne Arundel County. What is the county doing wrong or what do you think it should be doing different with regard to the opioid crisis? This commission did an Arcan training. Um, I've talked a lot to Wes Adams about this. He's got a personal story that goes with this. Um, this is a really heart-wrenching situation. I think the safe stations is a great beginning. It's fantastic that somebody can, can come and turn themselves in and get the help that they need at that point. The problem is we don't have the services on the back end to really make sure that the people who come and want to get clean stay clean. Um, we don't necessarily have the ability, we don't have liaisons with um, you know, certain 
agencies or workforces that are willing to hire someone who is in recovery like that. We need the, the transportation, the wraparound services. We need more people who are willing to provide that because it's a long road and the whole family is involved. And I, I met recently with a woman, they actually just opened up shop here in Edgewater, um, right off Mitchell's Chance Road. And they're trying to put this type of program together. She's a licensed clinician and they're trying to make these connections uh, because there are so many even high school students that we're seeing who are overdosing. Um, I, I really think that the back end is where the county hasn't gotten there yet, and that's that's where we need to go. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm not going to say anything too differently than that, because actually I do think um, it's that that back end. The safe, the safe Stations is a great program. That's one of the areas that our government is doing a good job of. That, that is a way we are leading um, as a local jurisdiction throughout the country. We've gotten national recognition for it. It's a good thing. The problem is what happens when they leave. And so I've heard some people, and I've heard the, the SHU administration throw out, you know, like X number of people, we just, we've never seen them again. So it's like they leave and they don't come back to that same station and they're like, hey, that's great. But we don't know where they go. And statistics will tell you, and the studies will tell you that 90% of people that don't get medically assisted treatment relapse. That's just, that's a fact, that's what it is. And so we have to find a way to get people from safe stations or get people from their homes and the crisis response teams into medically assisted treatment fast. And we just can't do that right now. So people will come to a safe station, you know, and it'll be like days, you know, sometimes a, a week before they can actually find someone who can give them that help. And if we're not getting them the medically assisted treatment that they need, 90% of the time, they're absolutely going to relapse. And, and we've all seen this. There was an ambulance at, at my house again last night for a guy who lives five houses down. It's like the fourth or fifth time it's been there in the last two years. Um, and and it's, it, it is. If, if they're not getting the help they need after they've said they want the help, then, then we're not going to be able to really solve this epidemic. And that's where we've got to go. Um, there's state grant money, there's federal grant money available to help do that. Um, and I do think we need to create a program where we can then get people from those stations into medically assisted treatment on the same day, within a couple hours, hopefully, um, and, and that's where the next move is um, in our um, efforts to deal with the opioid crisis. Thank you, Mr. Kitchens. Thank you. Mr. Kitchens, if you're elected, what do you consider the most important constituent service you would provide? Our most important constituent service? Um, I think would be helping individuals navigate the county government. Um, when, when people have called, seniors have said, like, right? That, um, when I went to the senior center here in Edgewater, and when, and when I did ride the circulator bus, there were seniors who were complaining about, I called the Office of Transportation, and it rings and rings and rings, and, and I don't get called back, and, and that doesn't happen. And, you know, we are having issues with development where it's like, hey, how... You know, where can we push back? What does the code say? Like, what is going on on here? And people just don't know. There's a lot of energy of people that want to be involved in their government and in what's going on in their communities. And there's not a good way for them to know, hey, this is the person you call um, or this is what you need to go do. This is the form you need to fill out. So I think helping whatever the issue is, helping constituents, if it's, you know, hey, there's this dead tree that's happened. Um, there was a woman I was door knocking on almost a year ago. And I was like, what's your issue? And, and she was like, come in. And she like walked me in her house. I was like, this is kind of weird. Um, and she walked me all the way to the back, and she pointed to this tree. And it was this dead tree that the county had marked like months ago that needed to be cut down because it was going to fall on her house. And they were like, they haven't cut it down. Um, and, and so whatever your issue is, it, it's like, here's the person you need to call. And if you know you call it and they don't call you back, then I get on the phone. I'm like, hey, why aren't you calling my constituents back? Um, or I make the call for you if, if that's what needs to happen. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily one area. It, it is listening to people's needs and then helping them navigate the, the crazy bureaucracy that is um, our, our government right now at any level, um, I think is the most important service. Thank you. Sarah. In a similar fashion, open lines of communication. I think the most important uh, constituent service that somebody on the county council can provide is constant accessibility 
and letting you know that I, I am listening. I want to listen. I want to hear exactly what it is that's bothering you. What isn't bothering you? What's working well? What isn't working well? Um, these, are the, these are the reasons that we're, we're there, um, not just in the county council meetings, but I mean any time. Um, and, and I think that that's something that a lot of people I hear are missing, um, not, not related to any specific person, but a lot of times you, you hear, I can't get anybody to listen to me. I have this great idea. I have this thought. I, I live in this area, so I live and breathe this issue every single day, and I know it better than other people who live down the road, across the street even, and, and I have something to say. The open line of communication um, will enable us to move forward with the best general development plan that in incorporates the community concerns and the community desires. It, it helps us incorporate any bills that are going through exactly what the community is looking for and by ways of protections, et cetera. Final question of the evening before we go to closing statements. A lot of politics and a lot of discussion about what's broke, what doesn't work, and what needs to be changed. In the course of the campaign, what makes you feel optimistic? So, as an engineer, I believe we can fix things. This is what we do. Um, there's a problem, you find a solution. Um, and, and sometimes it means backing off. Right? Sometimes that means you don't build additional homes, but you find that solution. Um, I, I sort of I approach every problem that way with that optimism. Um, as an attorney, often we're there on the back end when the damage has already been done and people are fighting and you're you're trying to deal with it. And I still like to come at things from the front end, from the engineer side, and say, what can we do to make this better? How can we improve this for everyone? And you know. For what it's worth, I, that, that's how I approach everything, and I am confident I live here, you live here, I want this to be the best Anne Arundel County that it can possibly be, um, and I promise to give it my all and, and really take that optimism and that just absolute determination to find a solution for whatever the issues are. Yeah, I think what, what has given me the most hope is that, that there are so many groups of people in so many communities that want to be involved in what is going on. Like coming down to the Mayo Peninsula over the past years, as many times as I have, and just watching the neighbors of the Mayo Peninsula put together, you know, the, the envisioned Mayo program, um, hosting information sessions on what it's like to live on a peninsula, uh, being part of the coalition in Crawford that's pushing back against the enclave. Like there are so many volunteer hours that get put into those kinds of things by people that actually really do care about their communities. And seeing that gives me hope. Um, seeing that energy, seeing that excitement, seeing that tenacity in you all has given me a lot of hope. And I've had a conversation with, with a handful of you in this room where it's like, you know, like we keep kicking, we keep screaming, and we keep telling the county they have to listen to us. And I'm like, yeah, because right now that's what you have to do. But wouldn't it be great if the county worked on our side? <laughs> wouldn't it be great if, yes, we still have to tell them what we want, but it was the, this, you know, the, the systems of power were set up in a way where county was incentivized to listen to you, and it's no longer kicking and screaming. It's like, hey, how do we actually make government work with the people? But your energy has given me hope, and then the way that the, a message of changing that power structure, the way that's resonated with people, has has also given me hope. Like I ran a campaign on a shoestring budget, fueled, you know, like ninety percent by like super small donations by people that live in this district, and that there are enough people out there. That, that have just believed in a message of, of campaign finance, of you know, doing government differently, of actually going after the money and the developers, that there's enough of you out there that have had faith in that message to, to actually make a campaign like mine viable um, has also been very hopeful. I've met a lot of good people um, throughout this campaign, and, and your energy and, and the way that people have been receptive to a vision of, like, we can fundamentally do government differently. And if we don't, like, there's not going to be a lot of hope for, for this country. We've got we've to do it differently, but that message resonates, and that is very hopeful. Okay. Okay, before we go to closing statements, uh, on behalf of the neighbors of the Mayo Peninsula, I want to thank the candidates for attending tonight. I certainly want to thank all of you for your interest, for your questions, for your curiosity. We will be posting a video of the event tonight, so if your neighbors were not able to attend, we encourage you to invite them to watch the video and get educated on this. We invite you to continue to be engaged. 
I retired last September after 30 years in the United States Air Force. I have served all over the world. I can tell you the right to vote is not a given. It is a privilege. It is also a responsibility. We do these events to keep you engaged and educated. Please take advantage of that and use your vote. Ms. Hare, you have the beginning closing statement. Thank you. Uh, Really, I'd like to take this time to thank all of you. It is incredible that you have put this together. Uh, this is the second one of these that we've attended here for Mayo specifically, and other communities have done it too, Crofton. I mean, we've been a lot of places, uh, other places in Edgewater, et cetera. And it's fantastic to listen to all of your questions and meet you all individually, and, and I really appreciate that you're choosing to spend your night with us. Um, you realize you also have a lot of other things you probably could spend your night with, and this is really important and heartening to see. Um, I would just like to close with the fact that I am qualified. I believe I can do a tremendous job for you. I have had bipartisan support from all areas of District 7. Um, Democrats in South County, Independents in Mayo, uh, retired teachers and civil engineers in Edgewater, Crofton, etc. I believe that I can bring bipartisan solutions to the table. Um, I, I have spoken with small businesses. I have um, really worked hard to get to know as many individuals as I possibly can. I would welcome any additional questions you have. I would welcome the opportunity to speak to each one of you individually after this, and please uh, take some literature. If you are so inclined, please take a yard sign. On my literature, like I said, my, my cell phone, my email is on there. If you think of a question tomorrow, um, please, I have young kids, I'm up at all hours of the night, feel free to email me anytime. <laughs> um, I would be happy to talk with you further, and I would ask for your vote on November 6th. Thanks so much. So I just want to thank you all for being here. Um, I think you've heard, you know, there's, there's two very qualified candidates um, that you have to decide between. I think a lot of what the decision on November 6th is going to come down to is who you trust to follow through on all of these things for you when they're in office. And I'd like to put to you that, that I do think that the person who's taken no money from developers is the one you can trust more to push back against developers and push back against those business interests. I mean, if there's anyone here that doesn't think money talks, then that's totally fine. But I think most of us know that it does, that money buys you power. And that's something I've been very conscious of because if we don't get this general development plan right, and if we don't get this comprehensive zoning plan right, and if we don't push back now, there's not gonna be enough time left to actually save in Arnold County from the forces of overdevelopment. It is now that we've gotta take a stand, which is why in the very beginning, before I actually filed a run, I made the decision I would not take a dollar of developer money. Um, I think that matters. I think that means that you can trust me to be on your side, not on the side of big, of big developers once I get in office. Um, I also have a lot of bipartisan support. I have been, again, endorsed by the teachers. Um, I've been endorsed by the police. I've been endorsed by the firefighters. Groups that typically endorse Republicans, as a whole, have endorsed me because they know that I'm the one that they can trust to get the job done. You talk to the police, and like, what is one of their biggest issues? It's the stresses that overdevelopment puts on the police department. They have less officers on the streets now than they did when Steve Shue took office, and we have a lot more building and a lot more people that live in the county now than when Steve Shue took office. And so they know that that message of growth and that, that message of going after the power is what's going to be best for the police. Stand with the police on November 6th and vote for me. Stand with the firefighters on November 6th and vote for me. The people who do the work on the ground, on the environment, the Sierra Club, the League of Conservation Voters, They've all looked at us, they've looked at both of the candidates, they've heard what we've had to say, and they trust me to get the job done when we're there. So you've heard a lot of similar things from two qualified people. Again, it's who do you trust to get the job done? And I ask for you to stand with, with me and with all the groups that have backed me on November 6th. So I ask for your vote as well. with us this evening and letting us know what's on their mind. Uh, tomorrow night at 7 o'clock at the Maryland Hall is the County Executive Forum. I think it will be something similar in nature. So uh, we will be there. So we'll see you there. Good evening.